This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. This is the Talking Animal Law podcast, brought to you every two weeks by the UK Centre for Animal Law and hosted by Paula Sparks, Director of A Law. But it's not just for lawyers, it's for anyone who cares about animals. So no matter who you are, if you want to know more about animal protection, news, ethics and animal law reform, then this is the podcast for you. We come together on this episode of Talking Animal Law to celebrate the life of Sir David Amos and to discuss his animal advocacy work and his legacy for animals. Sir David was a member of parliament who tragically was killed on the 15th of October of this year. And our thoughts are with his family, friends and the wider community. I, like many in the animal advocacy community, was shocked by his tragic and senseless death. He was someone who was known as one of the kindest and gentlest of men who could not abide cruelty and was a great advocate in Parliament against animal suffering. Sir David was patron of the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation and of Catholic Concern for Animals. He spoke in Parliament about many causes close to his heart for the advancement of animal well-being and was consistent in championing these causes throughout his long tenure in Parliament. He introduced the Protection Against Cruel Tethering Act of 1988 to protect equines from tethering, and although this was repealed, the principles are enshrined in subsequent animal welfare legislation. He was the recipient of the 2011 Dodds Animal Welfare and Environment Award for the parliamentarian who had done the most to tackle issues concerning the welfare of animals and the natural environment. In the months leading up to his death, we can see just how active he was as a champion for animals. In March, he led a 10 minute rule bill on banning farrowing crates. And in September, he asked for a debate in parliament on the subject of World Animal Day. He spoke about animal welfare and trade at the Conservative Party conference in October, just weeks before his death. Today, we talk to David Bowles, the public affairs officer at the RSPCA, who worked alongside Sir David on many campaigns, and he has kindly agreed to talk to us about Sir David's views, the causes he championed, and his legacy for animals. David, hello, thank you for talking to us today. Yeah, delighted to be here, Paula. Oh, thank you. And as Head of Public Affairs at the RSPCA, you must have worked with Sir David closely over the years. Yeah, so so, Sir David was in Parliament for uh, 38 years and uh, the RSPCA worked with him um, for his entire time in in Parliament and had a lot of success um, getting in new legislation, but also a lot of success in raising issues as as questions or, or in receptions. Yeah, because I think most people, when they think about members of parliament, they think about the voting um, that parliamentarians um, do, but sometimes the work that goes on behind the scenes is missed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, and and it's it's interesting because uh, most people's idea of of, uh, MPs is just uh, shouting at each other once uh, once a week at (laughs) Prime Minister's questions, whereas actually most of the real serious work occurs collegiately and by consensus um, in committees uh, and in, in debates um, where, where MPs are, are very reverential to each other and, and actually listen to each other's experience and, uh, and knowledge of, of the issues. And one, one thing that Sir David did was, uh, because animal welfare was one of his three top um, issues, uh, Essex and Southend being, being another one um, and, uh, and religion being, being another one, but it was one of his three top issues. And therefore, he was, you know, in his 38 years, he, he did gain a lot of experience and a lot of information in that. So he could he could uh, um, he could raise questions to, to ministers. He could initiate debates um, which you can discuss an issue. And although they are not mandatory on the government to do something, they do raise the issue with mm-hmm. the minister. And if uh, trying to get change in Parliament and trying to get change to legislation is all about convincing the government of the day that the issue is important, not just to to people like myself who are animal welfare advocates, but also to the population. Um, And and I think one of of the great things in the last 38 years has been the the increase in public perception about animal welfare issues 
uh, such as that when we had the last election, it, it resonated hugely on the doorstep. And that's why we've got a government that is probably doing more in terms of changing laws to improve animal welfare now than at really any other stage that I can remember. So, so uh, the government knows that it's an important issue for the public. Mm. Um, it plays very well in, in Parliament. Um, and getting MPs to, to do this um, and raise the issues is a really important way of trying to then change the legislation. Yeah, well, I remember last year, so David attended an RSPCA drop-in in the House of Commons to learn about Generation Kind, which is an RSPCA initiative. And he said, I'm saddened that young children are being exposed to horrific incidents of animal suffering online in ways that previous generations have simply not experienced. We all have a duty to raise the next generation to be kind and compassionate to animals. I mean, that resonates so much today, but... Can you tell us a bit more about Generation Kind? Um, because it was something that prior to that, I hadn't come across. Uh, and what did Sir David's support mean um, for that project and for you as an organization? Yeah, so, so I mean, everyone has assumed that technology is, is great. Um, and, and, the, and the way that we've changed, obviously, the way that we speak to each other, we're doing a mm. podcast at the moment, which wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago, has, has been good. And of course, a lot of it has been good, but there has been some very negative things. We're all aware of the pressures that particularly young people are under on social media. Um, we're all aware of the problems of sharing stuff on social mm -hmm. media. The, the RSPCA has seen um, a huge increase in, in the number of animal abuse images that are shared on social media and indeed have taken successful prosecutions on what has been on people's social media feeds, either on uh, Twitter or WhatsApp or or, uh, or other uh, mediums. So for us, this was a really important change that's been that's been happening, and we needed to react to it. And what Generation Kind is all about is is getting to to the younger people, mm. um, not just through the traditional means that we've had, such as giving talks, giving assemblies in in school, but also um, talking to them about. Uh, if, if they get shared images on, on social media, what to do, what to look out for, um, and, to, and also to, to work with younger people as well. Um, if they if they've, um, have, um, have been uh, take, taken in by some of these images um, and, and have gone down a path of, of abuse to animals, uh, working with them, particularly through youth justice work, to try and under, get them to understand that animals are sentient, mm. animals have feelings, and that what they did to those animals have had consequences. Um, and then make sure that you don't get recidivism, that you, you, uh, you try and convince them that uh, animals are an important part and uh, treating them well is a really important ethical consideration, as well as a practical animal welfare consideration to the animal. So for us, having Sir David's support was really important because um, I think trying to, uh, there is so much information out there for younger generations. When, when you and I, unfortunately, were at school, Paula, it was uh -huh. uh, when we went to school, we got our information in the lessons. When we came away, we switched off and yeah. we may watch a bit of television or we went out to play in the street. And that was it. Younger generation now get their information from many, many different ways. And um, I'm afraid they can't really ever switch off. Uh, from from that uh, that deluge of information that's coming to them, so it's really important to try and continue that uh, that uh, prevention uh, policy of giving them the the right information, so that we we have a, a new generation coming up which is kind to animals. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I mean we we've seen the images recently of people taking selfies with a. Um, a sea lion that was injured on the beach and things like that. So I think projects like Generation Kind, they're just so important. Um, another area, I suppose the area that perhaps Sir David is best known for is um, his opposition to fox hunting and hare coursing. And his uh, role um, in Parliament was voting. He voted against um, you know, any amendments to the Hunting Act. He voted for the Hunting Act. Um, but also changing culture, I think, within his own political party had a very influential role in that. Um, do you want to tell us any more about your experiences with that? Yes, and, and when uh, the, 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 the great thing about Sir David is that his views never changed. He, he, he came mm -hmm. into Parliament in 1983 with an interest in animal welfare. 
Um, and uh, when he, the Conservative Party, obviously in 1983, was a, a very different beast to the Conservative Party in oh. 2021. Um, when he came in, what, a very, very surprising fact, when he came in, the number of Conservative MPs that were against fox hunting was actually lower than the number of giant pandas in Europe, which, is, which just sounds bizarre, because here we are now in 2021. Not only did we get the A Hunting Act in, in 2005, which banned hunting, but also just, just recently, just to bring it bang up to date, just recently, uh, the, uh, the excuses used by hunters to trail hunt has been shown to be a, a lie. And we've had a successful prosecution by, by the police on, a, on a, a, a huntsman who was trying to show people how to evade and avoid the law. So um, Sir David really was integral to that journey, both for, uh, for the issue, but also for the Conservative Party. Oh. The Conservative Party at the last election for the first time ever um, since the Hunting Act came into force didn't have um, in their manifesto that they were going to overturn it and and it was Sir David's influence during that time from from just a small very small as I say uh, only half a dozen MPs uh, grew the the support within the Conservative Party to uh, to now be a majority I think within the Conservative Party that don't want to see the Hunting Act overturned and it was his influence not just that got the Hunting Act into place, but also convinced his own party that they were behind the times and they needed to, to come up to, uh, to, to the future, which was um, no change in, in the Hunting Act and that hunting animals, uh, hunting animals with, with, wild, with, uh, with dogs is not um, ethical or, uh, and, and is a, an animal welfare problem that needs to be stopped. And, and I think he was hugely influential in that. Yes, I think he was. Um, and it wasn't just, um, hunting in terms of entertainment he also spoke out about aspects of the greyhound racing industry and again I'm looking at something that he said uh, he's, he said the life of a racing greyhound is filled with abuse neglect and early death and it's shocking that so many greyhounds die every year through injury or being deemed surplus to requirements by the industry and many more live in inhumane conditions throughout their racing life um, are there any RSPCA concerns about greyhound racing? And is, it, is this an area that the RSPCA is active? Yeah, so, so the RSPCA is looking quite, quite carefully at, at greyhound racing. And, it, and indeed, you know, if, if you look at Sir David's life, you go back to when he entered Parliament in 1983, mm. the, uh, the duration of, of his term in Parliament has seen a decrease in, in greyhound tracks. We've seen greyhound tracks being closed. Uh, we've seen improvements in standards. Um, we've seen um, we've seen uh, the, the way that the industry is regulated also um, changed. The government has brought in regulation on greyhound racing um, only about ten years ago. So so we have seen enormous change in that area. Yeah. And the RSPCA has has two major concerns with with greyhound racing. The first is um, what happens uh, to the animals, uh, the welfare uh, when they are raced, uh, when they are bred, and also what happens to them after racing. Um, and this is an issue not just for greyhound racing, but also for horse racing, which is yeah. which is a very, a very similar has very similar problems. Um, are too many animals being produced, um, which are then surplus to requirements, and then just tossed in in the in the bin? Sometimes literally tossed in the bin because because they are they are deemed to be worthless. So the, so the RSPCA does have serious concerns about how the greyhound ra racing is is working, and uh, we are looking very carefully at whether the present regulations are fit for purpose and what should be done in the future on greyhound racing. And again, you could, you could say that Sir David was ahead of his time because he looked at this um, and, uh, and it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't an easy, you know, it's not a popular thing for him to say. And he, he didn't mind. And I think that was the thing with, with him. If he had a view on something um, yeah. and if he had a position, he didn't care really what what he the the impact that that had on people that didn't agree with him he would say that position and he would fight for that position even if it meant that his party or the public were out of kilter with him and amazingly sometimes you find that his party or the public came around to actually agreeing with him it may take some years sometimes oh. even decades but they did so 
Mm. And I know you've spoken about the fact that we're in um, a fertile period for legislation at the moment for animal welfare. There's a lot of activity that's been going on over the last year or so. And so David also spoke up in support of much of this. So a new criminal offence for pet theft, measures to tackle ear cropping, import restrictions to protect puppies from the puppy trade. These are all issues that currently that Parliament is grappling with. I don't know if you want to say anything more about any of those. Yeah, so so uh, we, we're in a, a very, very golden age for animal welfare legislation oh. at the moment in Parliament. I, I cannot remember a time when we've had more bills in Parliament. I think at the moment we've got six live bills in Parliament, all of which stand a reasonable chance of getting onto the statute book. I've never seen that before. And, and we, we've got this real opportunity, which to be honest, I believe will only last a couple of years um, to, to change things radically for, for the better, to get rid of the illegal puppy trade, to, uh, to, to, uh, to reduce uh, pet theft, uh, to, uh, to improve our farming and the way that we uh, transport animals overseas or the way that we pay our farmers to produce uh, farm products. All of those things will last, I think, for um, not just decades, but maybe even generations. So this is a really important time. And, uh, and I think Sir David's legacy will be that he started those conversations. Uh, and I'm just very sad that he wasn't, he's not going to be around to see uh, what I think will be many changes in the legislation in 2022. Um, and I think that's his legacy, that he started those conversations. He was personally involved, you know, with, with uh, um, he had a bill in Parliament to stop uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, cage, cages for, for laying hens. He had a bill in Parliament to stop um, firing crates for pigs because he didn't believe in um, industrial systems of confinement for farm animals. Yeah. Um, and I just find it very sad that he won't be around to see those come to fruition. So sad. And another area in which <laughs> he um, also spoke up was about medical research, controversial area for many. But he um, was concerned about the use of animals in research and wanted to see it stopped. But we've recently seen the EU take steps towards a strategy for phasing out the use of animals in research. Do you think this government should be doing more to develop an exit strategy so that one day we can stop using live animals in research? Yeah, so so obviously this this is again is is a very emotive emotive issue. Um, you know, you have you have to remember that we we uh, we use live animals for for research uh, for medical research. You know, for for us uh, as human beings, but also for for our companion animals. You know, our, the dogs that we have are vaccinated against dog disease, and and that has to be that has to be tested on on animals to make sure it's safe. Um, so it's 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 a very very difficult balance to get. But again, one of the exciting things that's happening at the minute um, is the use of technology. And technology has given us a lot of opportunities uh, to look at ways of replacing um, animals in experiments and using technology instead. Um, some of that has, has already started. So, you know, some of the easy wins happened in cosmetics testing when, when we had things like uh, the, the invention of uh, of artificial skin to, to use instead of uh, using uh, cosmetics on the skin of rabbits. So, so that so they there have been some some major changes. And yes, there are real challenges in how to get the technology to work properly. Um, but I think that uh, that the first and most important thing will be for for the government to say that uh, we recognise this and uh, we're going to look at how to how to phase out the use of animals. Um, what a lot of people forget is the, the government produced a roadmap back in 2015 um, in terms of uh, looking at animal experimentation and reducing, uh, replacing um, the, the use of animals in experiments. But they, they did that in 2015 and then they almost like forgot about it. And I and I uh, what the RSPCA is asking the government to do is take that back off the shelf, have a look at it again, work out how far we've come, um, how it needs to be improved and then reissue it and then um, concentrate on actually bringing that into reality. Yeah. And um, farmed animals, I mean, you've spoken about Sir David's bill um, that lays out cages, the laying hens, farrowing crates. He was also against the live export of animals. And again, this is another area that's dealt with at the moment through the kept animals bill. Um, are you happy with that? Does it go far enough? 
Yeah, so so the kept animals bill, and and don't don't forget, uh, you know, I mentioned that Sir David was uh, advocating this for thirty eight years. Uh, the RSPCA has been advocating this for something like fifty years. Um, so so it's incredible that now we can finally see uh, the end in sight. Uh, the uh, the government has made it clear that they will ban live exports of of farm animals for uh, further further fattening and for slaughter, which mm. the RSPCA approves of. We support. Um, I think this will this will come in very quickly. Um, I expect the law to to be approved early next year, um, and then we could see a ban coming in place in 2022. And and of course, what again? What we've seen in the last 20 years is is a huge cultural shift in this area. Oh. We when I started in this uh, in, in, for the RSPCA, we had half a million calves going out every year to to France um, and to Italy. We had something like one and a half million sheep going out every year. Last year, we had about 40,000 sheep um, and no calves. And that that has shown the huge shift that has happened, partly because um, we have uh, we've found ways of keeping those animals here um, and not being able to send them abroad. Um, and partly because the the uh, the public campaigning on this has shown the government that they they needed to to react and and finally the government is is stopping this um, at at the, the the best possible time. So so I and again it's it's just sad that Sir David will not be here to see this finally coming into fruition. But next year I firmly expect this to come into law. Um, it is supported. It's not just a, an issue for England. It's also supported in Wales and in Scotland. Um, and we will finally see uh, the, the cessation of uh, those images that we probably all remember from yeah. the 1990s and 2000s of uh, people protesting at Dover or or even in uh, Sir David's home county of Essex at, uh, uh, at uh, different ports in, in Essex, Brightening Sea, for instance. Um, and we will finally consign that to the, uh, to the uh, history bin. Yeah, thank goodness. And I know there's been so much public support to end live exports. Um, it, the, the, the bill currently doesn't um, extend to chickens or rabbits though. So hopefully, you know, we might see some progress in those areas in the future. I think particularly chickens because, you know, they're exported in larger quantities, um, but certainly much to celebrate. Um, and farrowing crates. Can you tell us about farrowing crates? Because some people may not know very much about farrowing crates or why so David supported a ban on the use of farrowing crates for pigs. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the pigs are a much maligned animal because uh, uh, we uh, we we invented new ways of confining them so that we we essentially um, confine them in as small a space as possible to get the maximum profit from the animal. And um, we started off by by doing this by uh, by confining the. Uh, the uh, the sow in a sow stall. So um, so before uh, before she was uh, we, she was pregnant, she was confined in a sow stall. We we find we got rid of that. Thank goodness, uh, back in 1999, and the EU got rid of it in uh, in uh, uh, passed a ban in 2005, which came into effect in 2013. But but uh, when even when she gave birth. We then confined her again in what was called a farrowing crate. And to be honest, there was a little bit more justification for this because, because uh, this was all about animal welfare and making sure that the, the, uh, the, the female pig didn't um, crush her, her piglets. But, we, but technology, again, has, has moved on. Stockmanship has moved on. RSPCA Assured uh, no longer allows the use of uh, the farrowing crate. Um, and uh, we have about uh, a third of all the pigs in uh, in the UK under our standards. So we prove that it is not only commercially viable, but it is also an important thing to do for animal welfare purposes. And we've shown other farmers that it it's uh, it can be done. It's good. It's good management. It's good mm -hmm. for profit, and it's good for the pig. Um, and Sir David also uh, wanted to make sure that this was in legislation, not just in RSPCA standards. And his bill, which was to to stop that um, in uh, in the UK, is still live in the House of Commons. I think it will continue, even though he is no longer there to uh, to uh, support and propose it. Um, and I and again, I think it would be a fitting legacy. I know the government are looking very seriously at this issue. Yes. Um, and I think it would be again a fitting legacy if if we continue on this road and uh, finally we get that into legislation. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And. 
Just moving on to wild or free living animals, two issues that, again, Sir David spoke out about that it looks like there might be some progress on now as the import and export of shark fins, which are firstly by just horrendous, um, and a ban on the import of fur into the UK. Um, if those could be achieved, what, what's your view? Are we likely to see a ban in those areas? So I, I think I think we're likely to see a, a ban on um, shark finning. And in, 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 in case people don't know what that is, um, the uh, cer certain uh, certain populations, particularly the Chinese population, use shark fin in, in food. It's considered a delicacy and it's it's very expensive. So it's considered also a status symbol. Um, and the way that you collect it is um, is you you take the, the fin off the shark um, uh, uh, horribly, um, usually while the shark is still alive. Um, and then once you've got the, the fin, then you let the shark go and obviously it then bleeds to death. So it's, it's a horrible, horrible welfare issue. Um, and I think that the government will be uh, will be looking very keenly at at raising our, our own animal welfare standards. And interestingly enough, they're looking for opportunities in terms of banning things that are coming into the UK. Shark fins is a good example. Uh, foie gras is another mm -hmm. example uh, where we have, uh, we've not allowed foie gras in this country, um, as far as I'm aware, ever. Um, but obviously it's produced in countries like Hungary and, and France. And, and I hope that, uh, that the UK will be able to, to show its ethics and its morals by banning the import of that. Now, when you come to something like fur, the, the, the UK historically has, has played a very important part in the fur industry, particularly you know, from, our, from our days when we, we ran the, the fur company like the Hudson Bay Company, and we went into fur producing areas like North America, Canada, um, and therefore the uh, London in particular is, is, a, is a big entrepot for fur. For fur. Whilst, whilst the uh, the wearing of fur in the UK has has gone down enormously, and and particularly in, in the 1980s was a was a uh, a really um, in pivotal decade to to uh, to make sh people realise that wearing fur was was not uh, was morally not very good. Mm. Um, we have we have seen um, fur still being coming into this country and then being exported to other countries, and so the government are, are looking seriously at the issue of fur, how to do it properly and again like foie gras um, and like shark fin to show an important message to the rest of the world that our principles our moral standards are not up for negotiation and we will we will hold to those by not allowing products in that we believe um, if we if we're not allowed to produce them here mm -hmm. and don't forget we stopped fur farming in 2003 um, in uh, in England and, and Wales if we're not allowed to produce them here then why should we be allowed to import them as well? So that, I think that I think we could see some some very pivotal changes happening in the next couple of years on that as well. Yeah, I think this this seems to be a recent theme, doesn't it, David? That you know we're not just looking at domestic laws, but we're looking at how our domestic laws impact upon um, you know what's happening in other countries and realizing and addressing the impact that our laws can have so we had the ivory ban um, recognizing you know the problem with imports of ivory into the uk we're seeing it with ear cropping that's also the subject of the kept animals bill so that seems to me a very positive step forward um, and i know another area that the rspca is very vocal about and has been doing a lot of work behind the scenes um, on as well as trade um, and particularly post Brexit now as we enter into um, uh, trade deals and this is something that Sir David spoke about as well enshrining animal welfare standards in trade ensuring that we're not undercutting um, good animal welfare standards here. Yes, so 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 there are there's there's no point in the UK being a nation of animal lovers and having the highest standards in the world in if nobody is uh, is producing food to those standards or oh. no, or uh, the rest of the world is is still uh, using outmoded crueler methods and exporting those uh, products to us. So so this is really important um, in in terms of imports for for two reasons. Number one. Um, it means that we're not being undercut ourselves, so we're not being put at a commercial disadvantage by having produce coming in from other countries which isn't produced to our standards. Um, and number two is we're sending an important message to the rest of the world that this is, is an issue for us. 
um, and, and hopefully the rest of the world will catch up with us in the future. And I think one of the really exciting things that's happened is uh, under globalization is uh, the export of that, uh, those, our standards into other countries. The government has made a big play of saying that um, our standards are not up for negotiation, but also a big play of saying that uh, we need to convince other countries that our standards are the best standards to have and other countries should be following that. And I think you're, you're starting to see this. You, you mm. started to see this in the European Union. Um, and, and, you know, when, when the UK joined the EU in 1973, there weren't any animal welfare standards. Now there are something like 40 different animal welfare standards in the EU. And obviously that, com that covers 27 different countries. But also you're starting to see this in other countries, even countries like China, are starting to say uh, we need to improve the way that we treat animals um, and India and uh, South America. So when you're seeing that sort of uh, level and cultural change happening in other countries, primarily driven by, by the public, um, who are then mm -hmm. saying this is important for us, they then try and convince the legislators and eventually it gets changed into law. And I, and I think for me, that's one of the really exciting things is, is this global recognition. This is no longer um, an English or a UK yeah. issue, and it's no longer a European issue. It's now a global issue that animals are important uh, from their sentience, um, and, uh, and we need to improve animal welfare. Mm. And just, just finally, what would you say is Sir David's greatest legacy for animals? I mean, you've probably answered it throughout this whole podcast, actually, because he's been involved in so many areas. And as you say, some of them not necessarily popular at the time. Yeah, I, I think he was a trailblazer. I, th I think, mm. um, I think he, um, he came in with um, ideas on uh, animals were important to him. And he, uh, he was ahead of the country in some of those aspects. He was certainly ahead of the Conservative Party um, and they, they've caught up. So I, I think his legacy um, is that he, uh, he, he never swayed um, away from his animal welfare principles, uh, despite it being unpopular. Uh, and uh, and he has, he's fortunately seen a lot of those come into being, whether it's the Hunting Act or uh, getting rid of uh, sow stalls for pigs or getting rid of the conventional battery cage for laying hens. He did see a lot of those come into fruition. And he also set the landscape for for further improvements going in the future, Go, getting rid of cages completely for, for laying hens, getting rid of uh, farrowing crates for pigs, um, bringing in new ways of, of looking at animals um, in, uh, in research. And I think that's, that's his main legacy. Mm. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for your time today and also for informing us about the RSPCA's work as well because you're involved in so many of these areas and sometimes it, it's not always visible to people so thank you for that and thank you for just shining a light on Sir David's work. Yeah delighted to do so Paula and uh, and yeah let's let's uh, let's continue to work to see many of those things that he'd started but hadn't finished come into come into being. Oh thank you very much. Talking Animal Law is sponsored by Goldsmith Chambers Animal Rights Team at www.goldsmithchambers.com. This project has been supported by funding from Animal Charity Evaluators Movement Grants. For more information about the work of the UK Centre for Animal Law, please go to www.alaw.org.uk. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.